part were part two on the discussion of elections. And last week we stopped we, at the responsibility of the voters. Just to remind you, the original thing was, is uh, democracy something from the Torah or is a monarchy more the Torah? So we had some discussion about that. And it seemed from the Varim of Deuteronomy that the, uh, it was the Torah's position that there should be a monarch. I, but the Nasib disagreed and said, uh, not to disagree with our analysis, and said that really the Torah is not saying that one must have a king. Rather, there are nations that uh, cannot tolerate a monarchy, and yet there are others that without a king, they're like a ship without a captain. So it all depends on what the community needs. If the community needs to have a say in the action, fine, that is a valid type of government. And as we're talking uh, when we're talking about government, also it should be mentioned that it's not talking about one that is going to make laws that are opposed to Torah, but rather laws enforcing what the Torah says. That was what they could do: collecting the garbage, ensuring the military, and so on and so forth. That is what the government would be used for. Okay, if so, if a monarchy is the best way to do that, because for whatever reason, the people, they like to follow orders. It's much easier to then make that sort of society up. If it's a society like America, which we don't like dictators, we don't like kings, and that's why George Washington said, no, I don't want to be King George. Okay, and so they cause the presidency. So we have a republic, what is it called? Federal republic. Federal republic. A federal republic, fine. So it's, uh, we have that sort of thing. Democracy never quite made it in reality because you can't, right, you can't run a democracy. Who's going to be in charge? 51% of the people. Uh, uh, we don't have 51% of the people ever voting. <laughs> what, uh, what's the classic definition of that? It's uh, two wolves and a sheep having a discussion about what they have for lunch. Uh, okay, there you go. <laughs> And Rabbi Cook also was saying that it seems that where there is no king, being that the statutes of the king also relate to the general general welfare of the nation, the rights of the statutes revert to the nation as a well. whole. Okay, so he was saying again, if there's no king, it's up to us to uh, to enforce the rules. All of them have the same thing in mind, and this cannot ever be forgotten, that it is referring to the laws of the Torah. We're not referring to making up new laws uh, that will count the mandatory. Okay. So now we come to the responsibilities of the voters. It says, during various times throughout Jewish history, Jewish communities in Europe had a Kehila system, which was responsible for their its own governments. An interesting historical note on that is the, the reason that the, com the countries did this is because really, what's the only reason for what's the main one? The only reason, but the major reason for our, uh, government is to get taxes. Okay, since the Jews always had meiser coming out, and that was collected by the Kehila, so it was was not worth the government to make their own system when we already have a self-imposed system. So they what they said was to the leaders of the community. You collect the taxes and we'll leave you alone. You'll basically govern yourself. Well, that was a pretty good trade-off, okay? And, uh, it would be times that the government would turn against us, make pogroms or, or jihads, whatever they would want to do against us. But otherwise, for the most part, we were left alone. And as a result of that, our systems ran pretty well in that, in that system. So yeah, that was the Kehillah system. And that was usually run by a body called the Zion Tevuah Ha'ir. I have to, it's hard to read the translation here. The seven leaders of the city that collected taxes, instituted laws, and were responsible for the general welfare of the Jews living in that community. So the Maharam of Rottenburg describes how the leaders were chosen. Again, we, this is just repeating from last week. If there is a dispute among your community and they cannot unanimously decide who the leader should be. Some say one group and some say the other group. Again, we're not talking about individuals. 
We're talking about uh, the seven leaders of the city. It seems to me, the Maharam says, that one should gather all the people who pay taxes. Like I said, they have to have skin in the game. And they should accept upon themselves to make a decision for the sake of heaven and in the best interest of the city. And the majority should be followed, whether to choose leaders or to choose a cantor, etc. So if, on the other hand, so let them stand. If there are some people that everybody unanimously says this is going to be a good pick and they're going to do proper by us, so there's no runoff, fine, they get the, they get the bid. On the other hand, if there's no way to make a decision, one group wants this, the other one group wants that, so we have to have an election runoff, basically. And when we, the devoters, are deciding, it should be uh, one for the sake of heaven, which means that we have to pick the one that's, uh, that's going to do the job properly and not the one that would be in our back pocket or the ones or that really holds by our uh, opinions more than the other guys. And also, who's going to uh, work for the city? As long as you do that, so you're all set. So this would be the, uh, although I don't think any rabbi or cantor who's hired really appreciates knowing that it was, the vote was 51 to 49 to get the job. I don't think anybody really appreciates that, but okay. Well, it's interesting that he places there first for the sake of heaven, then the best interest of the city and the majority. Because everything... And in the best interest of the city, I'm sorry. Correct. Everything has to be the Shem Shemayim. If it's not the Shem Shemayim, nothing is going to work. Right. That, that's the basic principle of Judaism. Whatever I'm doing must be for the, for the Shem Shemayim, for the sake of heaven, for the sake of God. And once I do that, so there, then, after I've settled that, now I have to look who's best for the city. Because let's say I have, let's say it's, it's the, the cantor or the rabbi. Okay. Religious folk here, who are we dealing with? So hopefully they're going to always be the Shem Shemayim, either one of those posts. But there's one guy who's going to be, be better for the city than the other because of politics or because he has a better voice, whatever the case is. So you have to pick the guy, one, who was really a mensch, and number two, he's going to, is going to be for the best that the city could accept, or could expect. Okay? Now the Maharam stresses the importance that every voter vote altruistically for the sake of heaven and with the best interests of the community in mind. Rabbi Avram Yeshaya Karolitz, otherwise known as the Chazon Ish, which in Yerza Hashem, we will start to learn after Pesach on Tuesday at 7 to 8 p.m. <laughs> That's my ad. Okay. Right. Takes this ad, as for the three people watching this, takes this idea one step further. He said, if the seven appointed leaders of the city are not proper leaders, and they were not, and they and they were elected by people who didn't vote for the sake of heaven, but rather based on their friendship with that, with certain people, the elected leaders have no official power. So you could disobey their ruling without uh, with impunity. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yes, the Chazan Ish was very strong in this. And we'll find out again Tuesday why he really held that way. But it's a uh, it, it's a very interesting thing because even though the, the majority of people voted for him, you would think that you have the vote, you have the mandate of the people. Still, they did it for their own personal reasons, and that throws it out. So now you look at the cases of our elected officials when Bush was going against. Um, Al Gore, Bush Al Gore, the first Bush Al Gore fight yeah, was a, a stunning tie, which took a couple of weeks or, or a month to figure out who the president would be. And then they said it was fixed. Bush did it. Fine. Bush was elected. And they, I remember everybody yelling, it was fixed, it was fixed, it was fixed, it was fixed. Fine. Not a clear mandate. Watch me listen to him. Then the second one, when he went against Kerry, he did get the mandate. He got 5149 or something like that, a little more maybe, but it, was, it wasn't that close. It wasn't that distant to the vote. But still, now again, they claimed uh, 
foul. They claim foul for that too. But uh, again, claim the same sort of thing. So uh, if, now the question is, did people vote in the party or the man, in this case, the Shem Shamaya, thinking that they would be, or Obama, it would be the best for the country, so on and so forth. Again, you have to, if the major, if they were doing it the Shem Shamayim and not the shame their pocket, okay, what he can do for me. But if people really wanted fundamental change, which is what he was advertising, so then, and that was best for the country in their mind. They did, he oh, let me just finish what I'm saying. I really don't want to give, I'm just saying if, if, if. I'm not arguing what really is. Okay? If, because that gets too far. But if that would be L'Shem Shaman said that they did that, because they said the system is broken, we need a fundamental change, and it would be in the best interest of the country, and the majority said that. So then, according to the Chazanish, we would have to follow that. On the other hand, if they didn't do that, and it was still the majority wins, clearly, because that's how the vote goes, that's, that's democracy. But if they were not properly, and they, in other words, we appoint somebody who wasn't proper, and they only voted because of their friendship, then, according to the Kazanish, it was, uh, we could, you say, like we said, with impunity, we could say, no, we're not going to follow you. That's the that's the importance of his decision as compared to or in, well it's not it's just compared to uh, what we were seeing before with the Maharam, who was just saying two uh, two things one he has to be the Shem Shemayim for the best interests of the city so the question is how do I know what's the Shem Shemayim and what you don't what you're really doing is for the Chazanish anyway I'm reading into the Chazanish but it would be that they're not following Torah. That would be not proper leadership. Again, I'm reading into his words, but I think that as we learn on Tuesday nights, we'll see that I'm right. But we won't put the cap on this one. Okay, that's what I'm saying. I'm not. I'm just using the the people at the uh, that we know so well. Okay. Uh, so now the question that you could ask is why is it so important for the voters to vote with the interests of the community in mind? If they are entitled to vote, why can't they vote however they please? What would you say to that? People can and do vote how they please. No, no, no. Again, according to the, we're going to by the rabbi. Right. We're saying the why, rabbi why said this. Important. It's important because if you pick bad people, mm -hmm. bad things happen. That's true, too. And so you should be voting with the interest of the community. People don't. Uh, and they are entitled to vote. They can vote however they please. Is it right? No, they do. No, no. I, again, I understand that. Real what, what what's being asked here is according to the rabbis, like the the Chazonish is saying that if you voted according to your own desires, and he gets elected, I that's the, uh, the elected officials have no official power. In other words, it's a, it's a it, we, we don't care what you voted. It's irrelevant because you didn't vote properly. If you abuse your privilege of voting, your vote doesn't count. That's what, and that's what he's ruling. So the question is, how can halacha dictate that? How can halacha dictate that? If I have the right to vote, well, who tells me that I must vote what's good for the community? Why can't I vote what's good for me? Only good for me. That's his question. Because it's not consistent with Torah values. Why? Because you have to give a certain amount of consideration to the people around you in the community. Because if you're a Torah-believing Jew and you live in a community of Torah-believing Jews, what is good for the community is what's good for you. Okay, I hear that. I hear that. Okay, here's the second question now. Suppose you feel that a certain political candidate is good for the Jewish people, but not good for the general population. Would it be considered, for the sake of heaven, to vote for that candidate? Gosh, no. Why? According to what we just heard from Mendeleev, 
that if, if you're following the Torah, that is what's good for the Jewish people. So let's say that that's what it but, is. But do you have the right of voting for the general population. Do you have a responsibility to the community around you that does not observe it? Could be non-Jews, period. Non-Jews. Okay. Okay. Any Anybody who's around you, if you're part of a community, you have a responsibility to at least attempt to exercise that privilege as well as you can. Okay. If the general community is way, way, way out of kilter from what the observant Jewish or that you are a part of, then I think myself, I would feel the responsibility to be supportive of the observant community if there was a huge disparity between. If the general culture and the general situation was close, not, you know, huge gap between, then consider what to do for that as well. That's what I would do. Joe Lieberman. My brother. Okay, them fighting words. You want to step well, up? What, what about step? Joe? Joe Lieberman was the vice presidential candidate. Yes, I remember. Okay. With Kerry. And purported. No. Not Kerry? Gore. Gore. Really? Gore? Gore. Yeah, oh, Gore, okay. Yeah. <laughs> which which was the bumper sticker go live. Um, oh, but oh, okay, okay. There were plenty of people around. Gore, uh, Lieberman was at least ostensibly an observant Jew. Right. That's what the re reputation was. Right. And everybody said this would be fantastic for the Jews, for Israel to have this guy in office as the vice president. It was everybody. Oh, you did not. Oh, okay. You don't hang out. It wasn't everybody. It was a huge percentage of the, nah, what do you call it, non-observant, but say the reform conservative Jewish population, okay. which mm -hmm. tends to vote leftist anyway, right. Right. no matter who the candidate is, but we're saying this would be great for Jews, great for Israel, okay. and even though he was ostensibly observant, they were saying, hey, he's, you know, Mishpach, uh, he's a linesman, how fantastic right. would it be to have this as the vice president? Right. It's got to be good for the Jews, right. except that he would have helped usher in a lot of policies and politics that would have been horrendously bad okay. for the country, as we're seeing now, but it would have happened eight years sooner. Okay. How does that equate with what I said? I said if there wasn't a big disparity between the needs and benefits of the Jewish community and the culture around, if there's a big disparity like there was, yeah. Then, on the way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. So let's see the third question. Suppose you are employed by an industry that would benefit greatly from the election of a candidate whom you disagree with on almost every other issue. Well, according to our standards, he's good for Israel but bad for everything else. Would it be considered for the sake of heaven to vote for the candidate for the purpose of preserving or advancing your career? <laughs> he's Sorry. good for your business. You're in the oil business. Bush is about to be elected. Bush is an oil man. Let's assume that the and I'm but you're speaking, a lefty oil man. And I'm speaking and I'm speaking only as the left would would, have, would enjoy it so much. Okay, he's pro big oil. He's pro big business. I am big business. Al Gore is opposed to uh, big business. Again, I don't know if he is, but who cares? For the sake of this argument, uh, and he's and he's pro closing everybody down who is using fossil fuels in exchange for social uh, so, uh, social power, uh, solar power. Okay, so who, now everything else, I may agree with, or let's say assume for this moment that I agree with Bush only on that issue of oil, but I disagree with every one of the other policies. I disagree with Gore on closing me down, but I happen to agree with Gore on the other issue. Who do I vote for? The one who's going to pad my pocket or the one who I, is really better? You're a business person, are you? Not uh, either employed by an industry okay, or would, and would greatly benefit from that candidate. Doesn't matter. I thought we were well, actually, we're talking about Jew. Yes, we're talking about Jew. Shemaya, you always say with Jew. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, then you vote for who would do the best. Yeah. 
benefits for the greatest amount of people. So there was, I'm going to become employed. unemployed? No, no problem. No, okay. you don't necessarily become unemployed. The oil business is still booming. <laughs> Look at the price at the pump today. Uh, again, if you would close them down, if you would put things against them. By the way, that does, just because the price at the pump is expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's a worker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. I don't know what she says. I'm neither, neither, irony. neither the three people out there who are listening to the share. A little irony okay. There. So now, if, so that's, that would be how the voters should act. Okay, again, that's be the Shem Shemayim, has to be for the betterment of the community. If I have those two things in mind, then the odds are I'm going to have a, a well oiled machine. If I go for my personal interest, versus the community's interest, the odds are I'm going to ruin the very community I'm trying to create. And by the way, this is this is also a very important philosophical point, that if I always do anything with shame Shemayim, which means I'm, I can try, hopefully I'm on the right side of, of the tracks for this, but if it doesn't always fit my world outlook, but really is for the community, the best for the community, then that is going to help, ultimately, it's going to help me. For instance, if I don't mow my lawn because I'm against mowing lawns, okay, I feel that we should let the grass grow and let it blow in the wind, this beautiful nature is wonderful, blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to water my lawn every single day so it grows even better. And everybody looks, and of course, my yard looks disgusting. And I'm lowering the value of the even though I'm really good for my ecosystem because I haven't used my Riggs and Stratton motor, uh, which is the worst polluter You're out there. You're not to be using an old-fashioned push mower. What the heck are you using good. Riggs and okay. Stratton anyway? Even, and, and I remember them saying that that is, that's, pollutes worse than my car. I was thinking, are you crazy? It's a three-point-something engine. You want something that can pollute more? Well, it doesn't have all the... Uh, okay, whatever. So emissions. imagine that. And, I, and people come to me and say, you, do, you realize, do you not realize how you're affecting our uh, uh, the price of our houses? And I look at them, do you not realize how you are destroying my atmosphere? Okay. What's going to happen is I'm, I'm not acting on, on everybody's behalf. Everybody's behalf means I have to keep my lawn to a certain level. Okay. And that way everybody, the property values hopefully go up and we can all sell at a high price and so on and so forth. But that's the same thing going on here, the same philosophy. If I only care about me and not about the rest, I'm ruining that very, that, that very area that I'm in. I don't need that. I want everybody to prosper. So that's why, that's a major reason, though, if we're saying, the shame Shemayim, what's the shame Shemayim? That, I, that Hashem wants us all to do well. Really, His desire is that we all work together and not just look at what's best for me. There's not a, a, a me situation. There's an us situation. That's why it's called the U.S. Oh, I'm not kidding. Okay. It was a good. It was a good line. No, I like that. You need a new writer. You need a new writer. Okay. <laughs> okay then. I'll stay. I'll. I'll keep my day job. Okay. The response. <laughs> so now we look at the responsibility of the elected officials. Now we hit. This is where all the elected officials are going to zone in on this one part of my class. Okay. If voters are expected to vote in the interest of the community in mind, we should certainly expect the elected leaders to do the same when making decisions that affect the community. So, in Pirkei Avot, it says those who toil with the congregation should toil for the sake of heaven. Okay? Now, why else would somebody become a president or a vice president of an organization that does not net them much money. In other words, when you're running when you're running a show, or for that matter, when you're running the United States of America, you do not make it rich. No, I don't, no, 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 you don't. Some people just want it for the power. So Even if it's for the a power. Okay. Uh, but uh, think about it. What I'm saying. The president is only making what four hundred thousand to run the organization. It's only four hundred, right? That's all. Technically. Well, he, after that, he gets all his it's, money. It's, it's kind of like the Army, you know. I was making $325 a month as an E3 right. in know. 1973, right. which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but right. I had food three times a day. Right. They provided the clothes I needed to wear. I had a place to live. I didn't have to pay for utilities. 
And the same way I could take. And cigarettes were twenty cents a pack, and the movies were and almost the, almost free. Uh, so I had all these perks. I couldn't hop on a 747, but if I wanted to go to Southeast Asia, I could have caught a 707 trip there. <laughs> okay. Uh, the, the point the point is that when somebody becomes the leader, unless they're running the C, unless they are CEO, they're not going to pull in the big bucks. Do you want to say it's for, for power? By the way, I would agree. I would agree. That is basically for power. Okay, when somebody's doing that. And the Pirate Award is saying, that's not the reason to do it. The reason to do it again is the shame Shemayim. Whenever I'm running an organization, it shouldn't be because I want people to say, I built this. This is the house that Jack built. Okay? I shouldn't want that. I should want to be, this is the house that Shem built. I'm just simply his worker. Okay? If I do it that way, then I will be, by the way, this applies to everything. If I do anything with shame Shemayim, I will be successful. If I do it the shame me, I will not be that as successful. If I am successful at all, I won't be as successful as if I'm doing the shame shemaim. Because when I'm doing it, the shame shemaim, I'm working for the greater cause, namely God. And there, there's no end in sight. For me, there's an end in sight. I want a specific amount. I just want I want a little bit of power. I want a little bit of cover. Whatever the case is going to be. Okay. Once I get that, or if I don't get that, by the way, I burn out. If I'm doing it the same shemayim, there is no burnout. You don't appreciate me? Who cares? I'm doing it. I'm doing it for God, which is, by the way, the whole Muslim movement was part of the Muslim movement of the ones who said that we have to denigrate ourselves and walk around in in clothes, uh, hair of clothes, as it were, and think I'm nothing. I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And that was so. The reason for that, and you have to go through a whole book to finally find the reason out. But the reason for that, I forget who, the altar, the altar of Kelm, I think it was. Uh, his whole point was if I do that, if I live that sort of a life, now when I go out and I tell people, you have to serve Hashem, and they yell at you, you're a fanatic, it means nothing to you. You can go out because you already did it to yourself. So you are, in your own mind, you're nothing. You're only working for Hashem. Once I have that ability that I can ignore you, and I can only say the, uh, saying the truth, and I don't care what you say, I'm very powerful, extremely powerful. Not for me, but for Hashem. See, I'm not saying kill anybody, God forbid. I'm not saying to put any, put any into Chayra. But what I am saying is, if you do it the Shem Shemaim, then there is no burnout. When I do it the Shem me, the Shmi, for my name, for my sake, then there is a lot of tremendous burnout. That's why clergy burn out. Because they don't do it the same shemayim. I, I don't think in everybody, but that would be a big thing, because they don't feel appreciated. And if you don't feel appreciated, you say, well, what am I doing this job for? Not the box, unless I'm some other denomination, which will be unnamed. But it, and even then, they're not getting the big box. Not anymore. No, everybody's, because religion... Is secondary to people, so we don't. Uh, it doesn't. You don't get that much. But it's uh, that's number one. So that's Turkey Evo. Rabbeinu Yona. We just have a whole class on. He said those who serve the congregation should serve it for the sake of heaven, not to receive honor, not to benefit from them, and not to assert authority over them. Rather, to lead them in a just manner, all for the sake of heaven. Moshe Rabbeinu is our role model. Yes. Absolutely. Moshe Rabbeinu, uh, Yeshua, we have a lot of role models. Yeah, but he's the ultimate. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying, a hopefully... A leader should serve the community and because of God. Uh, as I said, I, I would hope that uh, Shmuel would have fit that category. Yeah, they yeah. all fit that category. He would, but that's why we call him Moshe Rabbeinu. Moshe, our teacher, he gave us the Torah and he taught us how to live. So yeah, he was the... He literally was the person that we should try to follow. What time is it? Yeah, time. What time? It's very time. Thirty uh, thirty seven. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay. Watch it slow. Uh, I just want to make sure I have enough time. Okay, so now the questions would be how can a voter determine if a candidate is only interested in power and honor or really has the best interest in the community, state, or nation of mind? Now, this is an interesting question. How could one really determine who is 
Who's Check interested? Out Check out the record. Check out the record. They've had a previous uh, career with politics or running a business or running anything. Okay. Whether they did it for the own self-interest. If it's a newbie, you just have to take your chances and try and judge on their character. So what you saying? Yeah, I'll count the groupies and the rest of the entourage. Okay. No, I was looking at who they hang around with. Or who hangs around them. That was certainly the case with Bill Clinton. What did he do? <laughs> what didn't he I'm do? Saying, uh, lots, lots of evil things. Of no, all of his groups growing up. He was the, he, his record was Arkansas. Yeah, yeah. Right. He had a huge record for being a, a predator on women oh, okay. that worked right. for him or were some okay. kind and, of and, and there's a conspiracy theory that um, follows him around that suggests that a large number of people who got in his way or his wife's way were simply disposed of. Really? It's not a conspiracy theory. Look at the look at the evidence. Okay. There's there's an awful lot of dead people in his way. Oh, okay. I never heard that. The, I'm I'm the low in interest in low interest voter. I'm the uh, low uh, what's it called information voter. I never heard those uh, theories. You're the person we're supposed to be addressing with this then, because you're supposed to be an informed voter. Absolutely, I I'm Shame agreeing with you. And it goes back to what I said. If we really cared about the system, we would. Write the Constitution. Now you're going you would to read have, the Federalist now Papers. You're going and to have to walk the walk since you no, talk. Uh, talk. I can loan you copies of all of those things. I'm, I could, I'm sure I could download it online also, which I did actually I download the Constitution because I didn't want to read it and I thought it was an interesting read. But it was a. Uh, the truth is, in order to. And I don't want to get a caught in this, but the, it, as you were saying, as you joked, I don't know if it's such, such a joke that you were saying, but really you do have to read the old tradition, quote unquote, the old tradition, otherwise on the Supreme Court findings on many of these rules to find out what, how it's updated. Yeah. Because that, that is, which would be our, their Talmud for us. The problem is that their Talmud is not as good as our Talmud. That's all. Absolutely. But it's, uh, because they're all the same logic. But, but you can bring it. No problem. So, and now you can tell people to go to uh, uh, YouTube, Reverend Neville, channel, and subscribe. Okay, but it's uh, I'll get thousands and thousands of people to watch it. Uh, but it's uh, no, but it's it's true. If people, in order to understand where we've gone, you'd have to read all of those documentation, that all that documentation, and really think about what happened. How how Roberts Roberts was his name? That's Justice Roberts. He's the Chief Justice, right? Right. Yeah, we've got. How do you go up? You, you got him. He graduated. Graduate Chief Justice. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. But when he, he decided that Obamacare is taxes, that they have the right to tax, that was rewriting the, the, the law. It's rewriting the whole bill, actually. Well, the judiciary has been ruling by no, fiat but, for decades. But my, my point is, again, if we would look at those judgments and see how it was, and really, and we were all up on that, and we're studying it like if we do. We were all up on it. Those no, things no, no, let me finish. Let me finish. Let me finish. Like we do the Talmud. And like we do later, you know, all, all the, the uh, laws that we have, if people would be, if you would have a group, like we do of the Orthodox who are really involved in that. There, there is a group. No, nah, they call lawyers, I know. Exactly. But they're, not, but they're not looking at all those decisions and pouring over them and, and arguing them out. That's not what they do. It's not in every school. But remember, we're brought up from seventh grade doing this. Sixth, seventh, and if you're in New York, fifth grade. Okay? Discussing these things and pouring over the words and look at the Rishonim Acharonim. Again, if we would do that for our, if the American system would do that for uh, for us, the country would be different. There would be no way for anybody to do it, to be by fiat or anything else. Because people say that's illegal. What are you doing? You crazy? According to blah 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 blah, you can't do that. Okay. Again, we don't do that sort of thing because. We don't care enough about that. And that's part of the education system. That's part of everything that goes on. But and really, right. and what's the Heritage Foundation, even though they try to change that, they try to give out free to, uh, constitutions. If I just look at the Torah without seeing what the commentary of the Torah is, I'm going to destroy the world. Okay? So if I just look at the Constitution but don't understand what the founding fathers meant and what was behind what they were saying, it's an abbreviation of what they were writing. So if I don't understand that, I'm going to destroy the world. 
to destroy my country. It's, it's, a, it's a remarkably clear document. And we can argue this on a, di okay, on a different time, but what I'm saying is there certainly you'll agree that there's been interpretation of what's being written there. And the question is, was the interpretation by the rules of interpretation? Where did we come up with those rules of interpretation? Should we have taken it literally? Shouldn't we have taken it literally? Red Scott. Who? <laughs> Never mind. Okay. It's too complicated. Okay, so now the second question is, Rabbeinu Yonah's comments seem to be primarily directed at leaders who are only concerned about themselves. However, sincere leaders are sometimes asked to decide between two legitimate options, where one of the options happens to be more personally beneficial. What should the leader do in that situation? Again, they're both legal, they're both um, legitimate options. I don't think that a leader has an obligation to work against himself if one of those two options is genuinely good for the community and it happens to coincide with that person's best interest. I don't see a problem. Okay. But well, why would he may be accused of doing it for his personal interest? Does he have to worry about marred iron? No. What the Iowa perceive, what say, people perceive. Leader, you have a higher obligation to do what's good for the community, and if that happens to be something that's also good for you, then you just have to take that chance. Okay, now watch. Now watch. Uh, good. I hear. Now next one. Rabbi Cheska Landau discusses the issue of personal interest in the context of taxes. What's best for me? Okay. Tax laws apply to the leaders of the community in the same way that they apply to the rest of the community. As such. Every leader has a personal interest in tax legislation. So Rev. Landau says, in my opinion, if the leaders of the city want to impose new legislation regarding taxes, they have no special powers in this area. Although the leaders of the city have the status of the Supreme Court in Jerusalem during uh, temple times, nevertheless, regarding taxes, they are no different than anyone else in the nation. Even if, they are, even if they determined that this has been the practice previously, nevertheless, on a matter that affects them personally, they are not considered the leaders for this purpose. Interesting, no? If I am, and if I am affected by my decision, Landau is taking my power away. Wait, wait, wait. Right? What would uh, would we say that leaders of the city are eligible to judge their own matters? We're not going to say yes. So regarding taxes, they are directly affected. So now what is going? Let me just finish. So now what's going on is when the leadership is involved, the Torah, Rev. Landau is saying, "We don't trust you to do all this, Shem Shalim. We don't trust you. Even you're you're wonderful people, but." Your hand's in your pocket. We can't trust you. You have to go to a general uh, vote for this. You can't do it. Yeah? Well, I'm not saying everybody agrees, but go ahead. I can say it. I'm just saying that you're, you're going to have, these matters are going to affect whoever is leading because they do impact on people. So if every time you're going to have a case like this, you have to round up a whole bunch of strangers to do it. So this huh? guy strangers is your... your uh, so you're saying you go to a leader's site and everybody has to vote on it? So, yeah. I, I said, you're going for these particular laws, you're going to make a law saying for these particular laws, no one can, uh, no one group of legislators can impose it. Everybody has to vote. Correct. And that's why you have, what do you call it, referendum? No, referendums are not, they're not the same thing. It's like, when yeah. you ask everybody, yeah. what do you guys think? Hmm. You think we should impose this? That's a re now, they don't have to follow it. It's a referendum. So they can say no. <laughs> they, they have the power to say no to a referendum. But they but really... Oh, if the referendum is elected through, don't they have to follow it? They really... They, it, it, if it's a binding referendum. Right, yeah. right. Yeah, but and most, most legislative bodies in the United States now have laws or rules saying, for instance, um, we're going to jack taxes 10%. No, oh, by the way, we're jacking our taxes 5%, or uh, salaries 5%. Mm -hmm. But it can't take effect until the next term, right. which presumes that these people can be booted out right. and won't benefit directly therefrom. Yeah. But that, so they're, they're following this sort of thing. But, it's, uh, but really, that's what's going on. When we, when, 
when the person is directly affected by his decision, then Rev. Landau doesn't allow them to, for them to make that decision. They can be elected, very nice, but you cannot make that, you can you tell me, you can tell me when garbage will be collected, not a problem. But if you want to start raising my money, taking money out of my pocket, uh, you are affected by that too. We don't accept it because now we have to put it to a vote. That's what he's saying. Hmm. Okay, so, and, and think about that, how we yell at when people want to raise taxes. Can you imagine if they wanted to have a, t a hike, like you just said, 10%, and it had to go through us? What are the odds that we're all going to say, of course, no, raise our taxes, please. We like getting killed. You know, who's going to do that? Nobody's going to do that. You want to you want to pay raise? That's why in Massachusetts, was it was in Massachusetts or was it in general? I forget. Where they gave themselves a pay raise every single year, and it was passed at midnight, and it happened at midnight. Based on okay, and they passed it, and you, and everybody said, "Oh, that's unfair. How can you do that?" Well, really, as voters, we should have all phoned the capital and said, "You guys are insane." But of course, we all just sound like sheep. <laughs> Okay, if but, the voting populace knew how much power they really had, if they ever worked in concert, we could and, straighten this. And yet I came to class last night rather than go downtown. <laughs> uh, what's downtown? The county council meeting. Okay. Where they were discussing raising taxes oh, hey. to give a county department a salary increase after the director of that department promised that there would not be any this year. Read my lips. No new taxes. Okay. Let me just finish this up because I have to go to the meeting. So, again, with the bond, any dispute, pick your vote, any dispute that is for the sake of heaven will eventually have a lasting result, and any dispute that is not for the sake of heaven will not have a lasting result. The example of a dispute for the sake of heaven is between Hill and Shammai, and, of course, the dispute, an example of a dispute of not for the sake of heaven is a dispute of Korach and his followers. While Sh when Shem Ahilo and Shammai disagreed, they both they were both interested in discovering the truth and didn't view the other's disagreement as a personal attack, unlike our Congress, which is considered always a personal attack. They argued for the sake of heaven, not for their own pride, and therefore their friendship endured. Korach and his followers were only interested in themselves, and their dispute was not for the sake of heaven. When we realize that, for the most part, people who disagree with us politically also have the best interests of the people in mind. We can come together civilly even after an election, regardless of whom we support and appreciate their blessing and freedom in democracy. That's how it wants to end it off. Again, if we're arguing with change to mind, we should be in good shape. If we're not, if we're doing just doing it by party lines or to keep the other guy or to stop the other guy from having power, it's not the change to mind. We will self-destruct. No question about that. I still say and I will maintain whether or not I do it is a separate question, but I really do believe that if this country is going to last in the way that we, with our American exceptionalism that we so desire, the only way to do that is going to be to really invest in the country by investing in education of what this country was, is, and should be in the future. And if that happens, then we'll elect the right people. If not, we won't.